Uh, so next up, we got Giacomo here, old timer from the room as well. Uh, and he's going to tell us about modern VoIP infrastructures. Uh, take it away. Yes, thanks. So this is um, a sort of back chat that we've been having for a couple of years with Federico. And uh, we've been working on this concept for some time now. And uh, Federico um, did a presentation of, a little bit more extended than this in September at JanusCon. And uh, today we will see something like a light version, which is more focused on uh, on uh, signaling. And the other uh, the other parts that we typically cover are more related to media handling, QoS, debugging tools, and uh, security. So I've been in the VoIP area for some time now, and um, I've been in various companies that use open source uh, components and uh, involved with the Kamailu projects and other projects in the, in the, in the area, like uh, Janus, uh, Asterisk, and FreeSwitch, and RTP Engine, and so on. And um, so uh, let's, uh, let's see the overview. As I mentioned, uh, we, we'll cover mainly signaling today. And we, we'll, we'll see a little bit about the evolution of the infrastructures where VoIP is actually deployed nowadays, and uh, uh, which bits of VoIP are impacted and um, some workarounds, so what you typically see together uh, today and possibly something, some thoughts for, for the future. So why the cloud and why we are developing, deploying VoIP platforms in cloud infrastructure is easy to sell. There are many, um, there are many advantages. Uh, sometimes even the customers or the partners some, somehow expect it. Uh, HA is uh, definitely more easy, more easy to, to achieve and uh, scalability comes uh, in an easier way. And the, if, if you are starting small, it's easier to then grow and have a small upfront, um, upfront investment. Uh, geographic distribution, which is uh, very valuable, it's easier to, um, to achieve and if, even if with uh, small, small implementations. And sometimes you get uh, for, for the easiest things, you, you get tools that are just there off the shelf, like HTTP load balancers or caching systems like Redis and um, DNS already there and so on. Um, so th there are some challenges, though, because when you choose a cloud, uh, cloud provider, then you, if you already have a system, you most probably need to redesign either the entire infrastructure the entire architecture or parts of it. And instead, if you are uh, starting from a specific cloud provider, you probably need to take some decisions that you will, you will need to cover in the future. And you, you may pay if, uh, you, if, if you decide just to, to move uh, to another provider. And sometimes you don't have res uh, shared um, dedicated resources and it's difficult to assess the impact in the real time, uh, in, uh, in a real time context. Uh, and uh, so it's not easy if you if you instead decide to spread a little your your strategy and not relying on a single cloud provider, you may have part of the infrastructure in a cloud provider and part in another, and there is no standard simple solution that works every time. Typically, you need to um, either uh, do something specific like VPNs or discuss with the providers for a specific solution, but th there isn't anything that you can just use. And sometimes you have uh, tools that are just specific for, from, from, from those cloud providers. So uh, just in general, we, we moved, so starting from 2001 and so on, I think we moved from the server side where the max up time was a reasonable goal and was considered the, the positive uh, achievement but now what we focus on is the maximum possible resilience to restart of the applications. And we moved from configuration updates just uh, maybe more recently to an infrastructure that it can be called immutable where when you want to change something, you don't change the configuration, you change the components uh, that, are, that are involved, like, for example, deploying new container images. Um, so we grew up in our VoIP uh, experience with uh, a very simple infrastructure where everything was under our control. Uh, 
provisioning wasn't that simple. Things uh, didn't move didn't move fast, but we had um, we we could uh, know everything. IP addresses uh, we could have public IP addresses directly on the machines, and we had full, full control on firewall and uh, what um, what now are called typically security groups. But then, if you look back, so we, we stumbled upon this uh, tweet from Rosenberg last last year, and he said, "Well, you know, uh, this is how time how much time has passed since this uh, work on this protocol started." So, if you see. Uh, just uh, RTP and SIP, we're talking more than 20 years. And but if you compare it with the evolution of the um, of the infrastructure inside, you, you see that most of the protocols were actually designed when the infrastructure was different than today. And I think this is uh, uh, this is probably also visible in some in some aspects. And we're we're going to to take a look. So. This is more similar to what we would like to see. Not care that much about uh, the, uh, or better, being able to have our systems provided by containers. So any uh, orchestration system, generically, even uh, Kubernetes possibly. But then, in particular for the inbound part, having a component like this, uh, this blue load balancer thing that we draw, a component that is um, uh, VoIP aware and is able to uh, manage the incoming, the incoming and possibly also the outgoing traffic, but with minimum uh, uh, configuration and with minimum, with minimum work, uh, as you can do, for example, with HTTP. The problem is what we typically end up working now is more likely something like this. So you have elastic IPs or static IPs depending on the cloud infrastructure, so floating IPs in general. And you need to take care of their allocation and associate them to uh, your virtual machines or to your, your containers and manage the relationship with the service that, that's behind those uh, floating IP addresses. Sometimes if you want to maximize reliability, you typically have a, a, a virtual machine or a container in active mode and another one in standby mode. But then you have constraints on how the standby can, uh, check, can do the health checks for the, for the active one. For example, in, in AWS, you can, you can do uh, level three checks only inside the same availability zone. And you need to take care of all these um, details by, by yourself. So in, in general, something that, that uh, impacts the, the, the architecture is that the IP addresses, in, when you are in, a, in particular with containers that can be, can, can be brought up and down, the IP addresses change, and not only the relationship with uh, the, the, the public interface, but also the, if you redeploy a container, you may have a different IP address. This doesn't work well with, in general with uh, uh, signaling. And uh, typically, you don't get a, you only get a one-to-one -one nothing because, be, between your machines and a public, a public interface, and you, you don't have a direct visibility of your public IP addresses. Um, so slightly related, but not for this session, is also the, the difference between the bandwidth that the cloud providers tell you that you have and instead the packet rate that you actually have. And also, the, typically, you don't even know what your maximum packet rate is because the bandwidth is computed with Jumbo packets and not with uh, the small packets that come with um, uh, codec um, optimization. And also, uh, containers are ephemeral, so they can uh, be brought up and die, and then you need to do something for the calls that do have a state and uh, other things that are less important but still critical for operations, which is related to logs and um, other uh, information like traces, for example. So the, the main difference between an HTTP-based or web-based world and VoIP is that uh, you, you may say that VoIP sessions are, are sticky. They are not part of the um, request and response paradigm. And um, 
it, this, is, this doesn't cope well with an architecture that uh, adds components, but at the same time can remove components, which may be even more tricky. So you, you need to find a balance between the immutability of the, uh, uh, the, the state of the calls, but also the volatility of the components that are serving, uh, that are providing the service. Um, as we mentioned, the IP addresses are ephemeral. So one uh, time ago, you could, you could decide this is your, your box. It will have a long time. It will have a public IP address, possibly one or more um, uh, private IP addresses. And um, it, it signaling for ongoing calls could rely on those IP addresses for correct uh, routing. Um, this, is, uh, this is difficult to achieve now with uh, the um, volatility of IP addresses. And uh, so you need to shift the, develop, the design of the architecture more towards DNS and in general. So uh, having, for example, to work with console and be assured that routing is done with DNS and not with IP addresses, which is uh, an additional, an additional uh, complexity. And it doesn't really provide a solution for, for RTP. And we'll see later um, a little bit what um, Rosenberg uh, has been proposing recently in relation to this. So in, in general, we have a, a lack of native components for VoIP in, uh, in cloud infrastructure. And in particular, we don't have what we would like to have, which is basically just a, a SIP load balancer. So what typically happens is that you, you talk with the people in your team and they say, well, okay, just use a load balancer, just pick up a load balancer. But then uh, I'm having these conversations over and over. This, is, uh, this is just doesn't work. So first of all, AWS Elastic Load Balancer work only for HTTP. So the network load balancer are, uh, are very nice and, and they are powerful, but at the same time, first of all, for TCP and TLS, which is the best scenario, they are based on, on the stream. So they, they don't do load balancing. They do stream balancing between a source of the stream and a target group. And for UDP, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. And we will see quickly an example. And the same can be, can be exactly, say, at this level of abstraction with uh, uh, Google uh, Cloud pl Platform. Um, so just uh, to give an example, so as long as you have UDP traffic coming in, if you use just an AWS and NLB, it will choose one target and will uh, route the requests to that target, but also it will route back the responses, which is very useful. But if the call is long enough, that is, there are requests from the server, like a reinvite or, or a buy from the server, after some time, you may end up in the, in the uh, scenario on, um, on the right where uh, there's no more trapped connection in the load balancer. And the, basically, the requests go directly from the target to the client. And it's more likely than not, the, the client will not even accept those, uh, those packages. Um, so, and I was, of course, we've been reading during these months and we were looking at uh, uh, suggestions and recommendations and then, I don't know, you can pick up, for example, this AWS uh, white paper about the, all the solutions for real-time communication, then you start getting more and more excited as you read, but then you find this uh, eventually when you, when you need to find a real solution for SIP networks, you find something like this that says if you really want to do level four load balancing and UDP is involved and you use SIP, then you need to search for an application in the marketplace basically and use it, which is not what we want because more or less it's what we are all redesigning each, each one of one in our own, in our own case. This is media, I'm going to, to cover it, not, uh, uh, not this one, not the bug. So this is part of a bigger, a bigger conversation. So as we said, there's no interconnecting, there's no standard interconnection with, with, uh, with clouds. So, and these are the, the workarounds that we see today. Everybody is rebuilding their own load balancer, so we are not doing a common work from this point of view. Of course, we can use uh, Camellia, we can use OpenSIPs or Dracti or other solutions, then we are more or less duplicating the work. And um, uh, there are still around drain scripts. There's nothing automatic in the, in the, uh, in the infrastructure themselves. And so quickly to conclude, 
Uh, if you take a look at this proposal, this is a proposal for changing the way trunking is made in uh, between uh, uh, VoIP providers. It doesn't cover this uh, client-to-server communication, but in our opinion, it can, it can be extended to cover that. And basically, it's a way of setting up trunks uh, using HTTP 3 and uh, also having the media flowing through uh, parallel qu uh, quick connections rather than using RTP. So this could be something that uh, at community level we can, uh, we, we, we can discuss. So just very, very quickly, uh, it, SIP and RTP, just as, as an example, do, are, are old, but at the same time even WebRTC is dragging more and more uh, usage of these protocols because they they made the bridging between the, all the new WebRTC applications that are um, being designed and the good old PSTN world. So for the long term what we would like to have is a VoIP load balancer, a concept that can scale up internally that uh, is aware of the target uh, servers that can distribute calls and uh, proper managing the dialogues and, uh, uh, and, and the VoIP sessions, uh, avoiding uh, vendor lock-in so we can move more easily from a cloud provider to another and have some best practices uh, and possibly refine the other protocols. And that's all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Giacomo. Maybe we have time for one question until it's all set up. One question. No question. Okay, and okay. no. Thank oh, you. Thanks. Okay.